Okay, the system award management uh, is just basic. It's what is SAM, if you don't know, who needs it to register, how do you register, how can you locate opportunities, other features of SAM, recent SAM updates, and how to get assistance with SAM issues. So all those questions, those, those bullets right there are important, and this is what we're going to cover. Uh, I will go through some of kind of fast, so if, if you don't try to take notes, try and capture ideas, and then we can discuss them at the end, because I wanted to leave you enough time to ask any questions about this presentation. Okay, so this is what we call the landing page. What is SAM? And you, this is what's going to pop up. You know, it says get started, renew your entity. It's already there. If you want to do this for the first time, get started. If you already have one and you need to renew it, you need to hit that button. So SAM.gov is an official website of the U.S. government. There is no cost to use SAM.gov. Let me repeat that. There is no cost to use SAM.gov. People will contact you. Once you register yourself, you will start getting contact information from what I said, those consulting companies who help people work through this process. There are companies out there that do it for a fee. But all this information here is free. It's just well that you have the time to do it. And it's a business decision that you should make on whether or not you want to spend the money for someone else to do it. Personally, Jerry Smith, I'll spend the money because I do not like going to these websites and, and just blah, blah, blah. And time is money. So you could be making money, but as long as you're making more money than you're spending, I would say, hey, then it's a, it's a no-brainer. Pay somebody to do it, hold them accountable, and, and you should get what you're looking for. So it allows you to register to do business with the US government. It update, renews, and checks the status of your entity registration. And it searches for entity registration, exclusion records, it's a one-stop resource for multiple systems, a systems uh, listing, wage determination, contract opportunities, contract data reports. All these things can be found in SAM.gov. You can view and submit a bio preferred or service contract reports. You don't even ask me what that is, but I think it the people who are in that space know. Access publicly available award data via data extracts and system accounts. And that's the information that we all have to post and sell like up. Every agency posts their opportunity stuff about uh, data about their opportunities and awards. Who needs to register? If you're a business and you want to apply for federal awards as a prime awardee, you have to register. Or the registration allows you to bid on government contracts and apply for federal assistance. Now that's important because if you are a nonprofit or something like that and you usually get grants and stuff like that from the federal government or the US government, you have to be in SAMDI.gov, USAID uh, related organizations, UN related organizations like my own, the US Refugee Program, they're in SAMDI.gov because they get direct uh, support from the federal government and you know, they have to be in there. So a part of the registration is your un unique identity identifier. That's assigned by the system, and it's a full registration requires more than just UEI. You have one year of your full registration that you have to update within that year, or you got to restart the process. So if a business does not want to apply directly for awards, then it does not need a registration. So if you're not expecting a check from the U.S. government, you don't have to be in sound.gov. If you're just looking for information, if you're just doing market research or something like that for uh, maybe your company does market research for small businesses and then send them a report of possible opportunities, then you don't really have to be in SAM.gov. But why not? It, it, my thing is if you can get access to all everything, go through the process because if you go through the process, then you can better help other people go through the process. If only conducting certain types of transactions, such as reporting as a sub-awardee, which means like um, Raytheon is the prime, I'm Raytheon sub, I don't have to be in SAM.gov to get paid by Raytheon. How do you register? Okay, this is, a, once again, you go over here, you press getting started. And it takes you through this whole process, how to set it yourself up, step-by-step -step directions um, so you click get started and then you just follow 
the instructions. That's the time and the patience thing I'm talking about. You gotta have the time and the patience to do it. Um, depending on your data link, you know, sometimes you can save it and come back. Sometimes you can't. I, I, I won't speak to that because every time I tried to do it, I always had to come back and start over again. But you might be luckier. How do you register? You set up a sam.gov account to register to get your UEI. The username and password are managed by login.gov. Now, I'm going to tell you, login.gov uh, login uh, actually gives you access. And that's an important account for you to keep up with. And if you have it, that you at least go in there, I would say once a quarter to make sure everything works. Because if you don't, and you wait until the end of that year, and you're trying to get everything done for the year, and you can't get in through login.gov, sometimes it may delay you getting in and your certification runs out, and then you got to restart the process. So don't let, don't wait till the last moment. Check login.gov, make sure your account and everything is working right. Um, make sure there's been no updates to the system that prevents you from accessing it because time is not on your side. If login.gov is shared, services used by government agency, multiple agencies now use login.gov. It is becoming the go-to and pretty soon it'll be mandated. Almost all of us will be using login.gov because it's a platform certified, is the security systems and everything is, are certified. So that they're trying to push us to a system that we know that we can monitor instead of monitoring hundreds of different systems. Put your, put your agency on login, go through login.gov. It controls your passwords and your account uh, registrations and all that. How do you register? Well, you have to complete all these things in order to register. You got to have the UEI. You got to have your core data about your your company assertions. There's a page called assertion that you have to fill out. Reps and certs you have to fill out. Architect and engineering responses for those who are in that space. Defense federal acquisition supplements questionnaire. If that's the space you're going to work in, uh, points of contact within your organization. You have to have those. And then your SBA supplemental page has to do with for small business only. Because you are uh, an international company, uh, you wouldn't have to do that because you're considered as a large business automatically because you, your company's not. Now, there are Canadian companies that have, uh, what are they? I think they're called direct reporting like uh, divisions that have established addresses and everything in the United States, but they're, they're owned by companies uh, maybe in, in, in Canada, Europe. Those companies may fall under this and may be certified as small if you are an independent operating division of a company. A lot of times you can say, okay, or if a Canadian company bought an American company within the United States, a lot of time the parent company does not do what we call innovation of that company so that the U.S. government recognizes the parent company. We continue to do business with that, that other company, even though they are uh, owned or an independent, a financially independent subsidiary of a, a major company. So there's that possibility that sometimes your company could be certified as a small business within the United States if you follow those, those things. How do I register? Continues a unique identity identifier. So one of the big things that I'm, I'm, I've seen is that the legal business name. You have to be careful with the legal business name because it has to be always the same on all the documents in which you present to prove that the company exists. So if doing business as usually don't work unless doing business as is on everything. So Jerry Smith doing business as Boomer Sooner Nation, it, unless all my documents show that, then they're going to question what is the legal business name of this company. So be careful. Uh, the physical address, post office box cannot be used. You've got to have a physical address. I've had people try to use these uh, 
there's a box, box ex express, a box, et cetera, where mailbox ex express, where they actually give you an address and stuff. Um, sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't make it through the system, but you have to have a physical address, the date of incorporation, uh, <laughs> state of incorporation. If you're along our border, especially with with you the, the Canadian border along Quebec, Vermont, and stuff, uh, for those who don't know, the date of incorporation of a lot of our cities and our towns in northern New England predate the states. So the date of incorporation sometimes doesn't match the state records because the 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 Secretary of State has a database of all companies that are registered in their states and townships and all that. If your company was established before the state of Maine existed and it was still a portion of the Massachusetts uh, conglomerate, then most likely your information about your company or your town exists in the Massachusetts State House of Records, not in Maine. The same thing with places like Vermont along there. So you may have the same issue along yours. Was the town established before uh, Nova Scotia or whatever, uh, Newfoundland or whatever, became a Providence? And so that's what we've found issues here in the United States along the New England border a lot of times. But that date of incorporation is very important for you to provide that uh, to on this document. Um, the national provider ID in the MPI for nine US entities only. I think that's that number we were talking about that, that we, a lot of people said, well, is that my tax ID? If you're not a US citizen, you might not have one, but you will have to do the national provider identifier the MPI and being a non US entity. Sorry, Jerry, sorry. I'm not going to say. Sorry, let's go back to that one again, the National Provider Identifier. Where would you get that? Is that like the tax ID number? I, um, that's the one thing I don't know. I don't know if that's issued to you by your government or is issued to, there's one where Sam will send you one, you know, we're in our other presentation, but that's one that I will have to look up because I'm not too clear about that because it's for non-US entities only. Everybody I talk to said, well, we haven't had that incident yet. I will run that one back through the program and ask them specific um, about that. Michelle, if you're listening, if you'll capture that to the National Provider Identifier, and we'll give you more information and we'll send it over to you guys in the email. Thanks, go ahead. Okay, and uh, the SAM.gov will validate the entity name if SAMGov cannot validate the entity, users can create a new ticket with, with, with uh, the federal service desk. So you keep creating the ticket and whatever. Remember, this a ticket is something that I need if I'm going to help you guys um, research this or put in what we call an escalation of your issue. If something takes a long time and you keep running into a consistent problem, you can go to the federal service desk and put an incident ticket in there, and then you could have contact. Um, one of our offices around the country, and we will do what's called an escalation where we go in and say, okay, what's wrong with this one? Why is this one hanging up? Why do we keep getting this rejection? So we can work that for you. And a selection must all so be made if the entity information will be visible into the public search res results, which means that you can keep your information private, but if you keep it private, then our people won't see it either. So, we ask you to make it public unless there's something in there that's really, uh, there shouldn't be anything in there that, that would subject you to any type of hacking, anything like that, or the information. But if you, you have, you get to make that decision. Once you make your registration, you can say, I don't want my registration. And here's why some people do it. Because remember I said, once you did all this, you can start getting all these emails and these phone calls from companies selling you stuff. That's why. But in doing that, it also oftentimes prevents us who are looking for you from finding you too. So it's a decision you have to make, um, like is sanity more imp important than profit? 
So how of uh, can how to register core data includes the following information, the business information inception dates. We talked about that. I was trying to scan through and see if I saw anything else about the uh, out of country, but all this you got to have your cage code, uh, ownership details. It has to be owned and controlled by you. For wh whoever listed, how you list your entity identifier as far as your legal name in there, all your documents show that that's who owns the company or whatever. All that has to to point back to that name. So predecessors per details. If you held if if you bought a company and held the contract, you got to put that details in there. If you buy a company, uh, you want to put that information in there. General information county, state, and corporation into the profit structure. SF explanatory, financial information, stuff explanatory. They want to know your credit history, uh, all that. Just fill those in. They're, they're, it's not complicated. The ex executive compensation questions. Um, this one is where you have to show that who is getting what as far as compensation for your executive leadership. So if you have a, a business of one, then that's easy to do. But if you have multiple people in there, you have managers, you have sales leads, and all that, then you have to basically lay that out of how your executive uh, people are being paid. And then the preceding questions that come from the FAR. Um, so assertions, there's another portion of it you're going to, have to fill out. Your assertions are the NARC, your NICS code, your product service code, your PSC code. Some people, some you have a PSC code because you do work with uh, the with DOD. So you, if you have a PSC code, you can put it. If you don't have a PSC code, don't worry about it. You don't have to go out and get one. It's totally optional, but it just helps them more to identify what you what you do uh, as far as what type of goods and services you're going to provide. The organization side, then your receipts and the number of employees, they're going to ask you for it. I say put it in there, even though because you might be an international company, you're going to default to other than small anyway, but they still going to ask you for that information. The electronic data interchange, uh, basically, I guess those are your codes, stuff about how you want to get paid or whatever. And the disaster response information, they ask you if in case of a disaster, are you willing to uh, do disaster work? And that was so that we would have a quick database of companies that are willing to, that we can call up whenever there's a disaster, rather than going out and calling up 100 companies, we know that we only had 25 in that zone. And if they don't have the, our, the stuff we need, then we can go out to a different one and say, hey, we've got a disaster in um, Vermont, uh, companies in California, are you willing to go to Vermont and help and provide goods and services there? Reps and certs, your name and title, all the facilities used for performance, following EPA guidelines, uh, whether you've been debarred or suspended or deemed ineligible for any federal agencies, there, the federal government, the U.S. government has a way of basically tagging companies which they said don't follow the rules or whatever, and they debar them or suspend them from federal contracting. And this is, have you been there? There's start date, end date type of things they ask. Convicted civil judgments, they want to know if you're um, did fraud, antitrust, embezzlement, they want to know those type of charges and they link with federal taxes. Now, that, now that's U.S. taxes. I don't know how that would apply to someone outside of the United States because really, if you don't owe the United States anything, then you're not considered to be a delinquent federal taxpayer because you don't pay federal taxes. But if your company is in the U.S. and it's one of those independent working businesses that are, are chartered and uh, in the U.S., then they want to know whether or not you are paying your taxes. Have you ever been terminated from a federal contract? Did you hold a federal contract with any federal agency and they terminated you for cause? You have to show that if it happened in the past three years. Uh, any small business concern is not something that's applicable, but in this case, you, you just basically put that you're ineligible for small business concern because you are 
um, an international company or whatever. Affirmative action programs. In the United States, we have uh, a review of affirmative actions. There's clauses in our contracts that certain companies are eligible for inspection and compliance reviews by the Department of Labor Office of Federal Contract Compliance. So if there's anything, if you ever had one of those where you were determined at fault, you would list currently in the middle of a review by DO Department of Labor, or OFCCP is what they're called, uh, report has not been issued yet. So, but you're also, there's an EEO type of a document that most of our companies in the states put together that shows their hiring practices that falls within the affirmative action programs. Labor standards, and yeah, labor's labor, you know, you, you just gotta follow them. Greenhouse gas emission disclosure. If you're within the United States, you do have to disclose that. Um, Section 889, cover telecommunication equipment, does not. Um, Section 89 covered telecommunication equipment. There, that is changing. I think that's going to be captured under what we call the CCMC, which is is the thing about a lot of our telecom, a lot of our IT equipment can be produced outside of in in certain countries. So you can't, as a Canadian company who has a contract in the states, you would be required not to uh, install or provide goods or services that have the capability of being monitored remotely. So IT equipment manufactured in China and some stuff for, in Russia and, and stuff like that, and Ukraine fall under that. Uh, yeah, and and uh, um, uh, Jerry, I can I can add to that too, and I think that piece is a new directive um, to the DFARS that was issued, and I think they're working to SAM to SAM.gov to capture um, um, potential contracts that would fall under this, right? And company would have yeah. to attest that they wouldn't be doing, you know, businesses or in their supply chain, there is no indication of these foreign actors that the U.S. have identified as not doing business with. So that's something new that just came up um, early this year. And, that we and saw. it does change. So, yes. you know, yeah. I would say you always go to your consultants to make sure that you got this right because uh, I tell you, I came out of cryptographic, and I'm and this has changed so much over the last couple of years because things that you wouldn't think are now, you know, these smart bulbs, smart lights, and all this stuff, and these systems like I can't even say the word Alexa too loud, or she starts asking me what I want. <laughs> So you don't know who's listening anymore. So this is what they're trying to capture. And but that that uh, standard is still being washed, you know, kind of worked out. So this may change in the future. I'm quite sure it will. But when you go through reps and certs, it's going to ask you for certain things, and that's where it falls in there. One of the certifications you're going to do is that you're 889 compliant. Architect and engineering response. Hey, if you follow up in this next code, then you there's some information you have to, to provide. Um, so it's just that if you're not doing any of those things, then don't worry about it. If you are, understand that you're going to have to actually provide some additional information about it. I don't know why they, they targeted those because those seem to be very mundane, but they are targeted for more info. Maybe we're just trying to identify them because it's a, it's a, a need. It's a constant need for almost all of that. Those are things what we basically need all the time. And of course, the big dog in the window is defense for supplements. Um, so if you wish to be it on any DOD contracts, there's this portion you have to fill out also in your registration. So, but if you're not, don't. Um, but I would say if you never know where you're gonna go with your work, and basically, if that's in your short or long-term uh, strategic goals of your company, then you want to be prepared by going ahead and doing it now rather than doing it later, because those opportunities, you know, with, with defense, uh, they they're, they go quickly, and there's a lot of people fighting to get to the table on those. So don't hold yourself back by, well, I'll do it when I see something that I think is worth me bidding on. 
Now do it now so that you're ready when, when the bidding comes up. Points of contact they're asking you for, accounts receivable, electronic businesses, electronic business, alternate. Um, the only thing that I'm gonna say on this, these points of contact, make sure that you don't put someone in these points of contact that does not work for your company. And make sure that you always put the alternate in there. Because when people leave the company, they usually take the, the intellectual knowledge they have. So if they know passwords and whatever, and they didn't pet turn those things over, and there's not a second in command to pass that stuff off to, or say, hey, Jim, I hear you retired. Uh, what about these things? Then a lot of times company gets caught up in the fact that all the, the access, and we're very into you know, passwords and stuff, and people can't access the, their stuff anymore. So you got to start all over again. And guess what? When you try to start all over, the system is going to flag that you already have this in the system. So it by the time you get it all cleared up, your old stuff would have expired and you have to start all over again anyway. So be very careful. when you And if you decide to contract for someone to manage this portion for you, make sure that they are not putting themselves down there as your point of contacts on any of these. Because if they're the point of contact and goes in the system, if Jerry Smith uh, Consulting Incorporated is your point of contact on all these, then guess what? If you don't pay Jerry Smith, Jerry Smith don't give you access to your, your stuff and you need your information. And we've actually seen that happen where consultants and the company got into a contest about how much they were supposed to be paid and how they were supposed to be paid. And so the consultant just said, well, okay, we're, gonna, we're not going to turn over the passwords and access to the system. And they have the authority because you made them the point of contact to go in and actually change those passwords. So you might have thought you had the password because they were the primaries on everything. They went in there and changed it. So make sure that the company and the people that you put in there are people you trust. And um, the startup I used to work for, we when we got uh, bought out, going out of 9-11, uh, a lot of the, people, the senior people were getting their notices the day they showed up for work. And then they would lock them out of their computers and they couldn't get in. But the thing of it was that a lot of the stuff that they had in their head, the, the passwords and the codes for other things, they took with them. And because they left on a sour note, a lot of times we had to reestablish all that work and work, all that stuff in the background to uh, get access to it. So be very careful with your points of contact. And the SBA supplement page does not always apply to you guys because you're not a small business, but that's what that one is. And for those companies who may be a small business, you got to fill that portion out and portion of registration. Okay, how can you locate opportunities within the uh, program? Right here, you can see special notices, source of salt, all these are pre-award. And then you have the post award notices, which is justification, seller surplus property. All this stuff is in there, and you can go in there and you can do a search and find it. Sam Dyke Gov account is required for government users who post notices and update notices. They have to have a Sam Dyke Gov. If you're a non user, um, if you follow contract opportunities, you save your searches, you got to have a Sam Dyke Gov. If you only want to view opportunities, a SEMDI.gov account is not needed. So how do you locate them? You just follow the, you just follow search, under, select the domain, you go in and say, okay, where well, you want to look at contract and opportunities, system listen, you select entity information as an example, and then you select entities, it's going to take you to And then you go and you do a word search to drill down. So search for item in the search bar. Remember, search bars is the same throughout. Uh, if you have any questions about anything, that little help button up in the right-hand corner, you can always hit it and then get help from there. Or you can call the, de the help desk and then they can walk you through it. All in contracting opportunities, the same thing. 
select the list in the follower on the list in details follow link above listing title. Of course, when you pull it up, this is how our GSA would look. It's going to have the agency um, follow the contract and opportunity. There's a list of vendors interested in competing for the opportunity of vendors interested. The list of uh, interested vendors down there is important for you because if you're not going to bid on the work, you want to know who is so you can reach out to them for possible partnership with the protege or subcontracting work. And you have to be logged into SAM.gov if you want to respond to any of these. Looking at it, it's one thing, but if you want to log in, you got to be, you want to respond, you got to be logged in. Other features of system listing, save and searches, entity searches, exclusions, all this is within SAM.gov within the database, and it's on the, the tab data services. Assistance listings, projects, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing, all the features. Like I said, it's a lot of features, a lot of data, and um, you can go through there and, and play with this at your own leisure. That's why this, this, this format that they had was perfect for what we wanted to do so that you'd have a takeaway to show you how to go through all these things and explain it all to you without me just reading the slides to you. I'm trying to pick out if there's anything that's different um, that would be of interest just to you guys. Um, and there's not, because you're looking for the same thing that a lot of the stateside companies are looking for. So how to save search, remember, in order to save a search, you gotta be logged in. That's the big thing about this. So you can save your searches. It's right up there, it's got a button, click save searches but it will not let you do it if you're not logged in. It's just captured who downloads what in the system and at what time to show use, use of the system. Entity searches, you can search by entity, but you have to log into an account. Uh, they are not accessible just to the public. You have to be logged in. So you have to be registered to use this feature. Exclusion. Companies that have been excluded from, from uh, federal contracting are listed there. But once again, you got to be logged in to, to, to see this. This is a list you don't want to be on. You don't want to find your company on there. And But I think um, from, from past experience, if you have a name that's common, like veteran construction or something like that, you may want to go look because sometimes people who have similar names to your company have been debarred, but because of the transition of the UEI and everything, a lot of times the COs just see the name and they don't match it against the UEI. So if, any, if you're ever told that your company has been debarred and you know they haven't, you ask them under what UEI did you find the debarment? Because that will tell you, oh, that was that veteran small, that veteran construction in Massachusetts, not the one in North Carolina. Reports and contract data. Lots of reports can be pulled out here, lots of information. Um, this is something that I highly recommend that unless you are a data geek, that you work with a consultant because I don't want you to burn up days and days looking at reports that mean nothing to you and are not gonna help you get what you wanna do. If you look for opportunities, this is not really where you're gonna be at, but it exists out there. SAM.gov has a, a lot of reports and analysis you can pull. Wage determinations, you can go in there and figure out that. Uh, set of wages, fringe benefits is maintained by the Department of Labor. It also has the labor, if you guys don't haven't heard it, Davis-Bacon Act, which actually is a federal standard of what certain jobs are paid. So that's what this page is for, for wage determination. So, and that helps you when you're putting together your solicitation, because if you have to use Davis-Bacon wages, you may be paying $10 an hour for a plumber, but now you got to pay $25 an hour. So Davis-Bacon is kind of like that basic wage which the federal government 
looks for people to get paid to do certain products. Managing requests in rows, same thing. Um, get more info, info, info. Manage requests in rows, same thing. More info, info, info. I mean, it's, it, it's, I can see why the people in this program have this as a full-time job. It is a lot of data crunching and data analysis to get to this stuff. Uh, it is not something that the normal business is going to do, but it is something that a lot of times you have people who can help you uh, either for free by using the resources like CCC and others, but also you can go out and contract for someone to do it. Uh, Price Waterhouse does this type of work. If you if you're looking for someone who's going to charge you. Transition from DUNS to UEI, of course, that process is basically over with. And it, it, it didn't go as well as we hoped, but we got there. So once again, we don't expect any updates in that. FAPS has moved to SAM.gov. We're seeing access point for information about entity management, exclusions, responsibility, and qualification. All this stuff now is on the sound by gov. Used to be individual portals, now is one. That .gov portal platform domain is growing and growing, uh, which means that there's more and more risk of compromise because the more information you put out there on a platform, the more people want to get into it. So if you need help, you go to the help page and it lists all the different things you can get as federal desk help top link trends and everything is all there more about how to get help on our help page and that's it i know i went through it fast but you're going to get it look at it pick it apart write your questions down submit your questions to cc or directly to us whichever one you're comfortable with and we will do everything we can to answer your questions. Uh, it's a good a source document for you for basics of it. It does not go deep into the, the weeds and sometimes that's where you wanna stay out of because when you get into some of these reports and stuff, you will burn up lots of man hours and come away just shaking your head. It's, 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 it's a data intensive platform, uh, data, data, data. But what do you do with data? The best you can. 